Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to thank you for joining us for Bible study today, and we will turn our attention to Acts chapter 4. I want to thank Reverend Manning in teaching our Bible study last week, touching on prophecy, and we are in prophetic times, uh, but today we want to look at Acts chapter 4. I do want to encourage individuals to fast. We're in a time of, of personal and spiritual growth, and what better way to do that uh, when we include fasting as a part of our what spiritual habits, our spiritual habits. May we have a word of prayer. Eternal Father, we want to thank you for this day. And we thank you, O Lord, for how you keep on blessing us and strengthening us. I'm asking, Lord, that you will use me. Uh, I know, Heavenly Father, uh, having a gift to teach, that the ultimate teacher is your Holy Spirit. We pray, O Lord, that you will minister to us. Uh, and through us, use me, use us now in this time of sharing your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Give God praise. Amen. May we turn our attention to Acts chapter 4, and we will share verses 1 and 2. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John, while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Two key words I want to focus on that we see in these uh, verses is teaching and proclaiming. There are those that try to distinguish between teaching and preaching. Allow me to say that you can teach without preaching, but you dare not preach. And I almost want to say you cannot preach without teaching. So, you know, but there's always a play on those words, whichever way a person is gifted and what's going forth. The main thing that we see in the text about teaching and proclaiming is that they're proclaiming Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. Now, both Peter and John had walked with Jesus and saw Jesus. And of course, they witnessed his crucifixion. Jesus died. He resurrected from the grave. They went to the tomb, did not see him. But Jesus spent time with them before he ascended to be with the Father. And it's that witness that positioned Peter's and John, Peter and John to not speak about the resurrection of the dead figuratively or symbolically or even idealistically, but they're talking about something that took place realistically. Now, what was disturbing about this is a number of things. It allows to first say that Christianity is a new religion among religions. And we know in this time that Judaism, those that followed the law, is the principal religion, monotheism, believing in one God. And in the text where we hear about the temple guard and the Sadducees, there's something unique about the Sadducees that definitely needs to be mentioned right now. Because the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. Now, often throughout the scripture, we hear about Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. We hear about Pharisees and Sadducees who are what we might consider as religious leaders in the Jewish tradition. And even so, there was one distinct quality that I remember from seminary, and we also see evidence in the word that distinguishes Pharisees from Sadducees. You remember Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, but he went to Jesus because there was something about Jesus that still piqued Nicodemus's curiosity. It had to do with this resurrection. John's gospel focuses a lot on the resurrection. So Pharisees believed in a resurrection, but they did not believe that Jesus was that one, the Messiah. So here again, Pharisees believed in a resurrection. So that's not foreign territory or something that uh, is out of sort 
with those who were Pharisees. But the Sadducee did not believe or teach or look toward a resurrection or Messiah. And that's what distinguishes Pharisees and Sadducees as I understand my teachings and reading the word. And so when Peter and John are speaking about resurrection, a resurrection of Jesus as the resurrection from the dead, it offends the Sadducees. Note back in verse two is where it said they were greatly disturbed because it was a part of their role to ensure that correct teaching according to their order was going forth. But to hear teachings that were contrary or contradicted to what was their norm was offensive to them because they're not only just teaching, but they're teaching, as, as it said, to the people. And this resulted, as we look at verse 3, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail unto the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So we already heard about 3,000. So, so the church is growing. Now here again, although Luke is using the word men and, and the translation I'm looking at of scripture, we know that it's, it's inclusive in terms of people. So people were being saved daily because the word of God was being taught. The word of God was being preached. We want to say to those of us who have been ordained as deacon and elders, those who have the gifts of teaching and those who have the license and preaching that we need to be about our father's business. We need to be about every week in some setting, be it online or in the church or in our homes or as we're passing by, sharing the word of God, but not to offend people just simply sharing. It's the spirit of God that does the drawing, but we need to be the instruments that are doing what? The sharing. Verse five says, the next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them by what power or what name did you do this? When we're teaching and preaching, it will draw all kinds of attention. On one hand, there were individuals who became saved. On the other hand, there were individuals that were disturbed. And not only in their day and time, even within the walls of the church, there are people who will be drawn to the message and then there will be those who will be what offended by the message. Nonetheless, it's our role to what? To provide the message, to give the message that God has laid on our heart via by way of his word in order to teach and to preach. Now, Peter and John were brought in to be questioned, to be examined. Who gave them the authority to teach and to preach what they were saying? What name do you do this in? Wow. I remember one time we had a revival at a particular church. I was still young, very early in my my ministry, my pastorate, and I invited an individual in to minister the word. And the word went forth. And I never forget that day there were a couple of individuals that came up to give their life to Christ. And we welcomed those individuals to the body of Christ, prayed for them, um, and continued with worship and doxology benediction and you know 
Typically, we would fellowship afterwards. An individual that spoke that day told me that anytime I needed him to bring somebody to the Lord, that he could do that. Now, the conversation was not about the Lord drawing them, but the individual really felt that he was the reason why they were saved. We have to be careful in the ministries that we engage, whether it's preaching, teaching, or even serving and giving, that somehow we are the sole reason for why people are responding. People respond to us, not because of us, but because of the spirit of God that God put inside of us. And we don't labor in our name. We labor in that name that saved us. We labor in that name, the only name by which any person might kneel and bow and confess. And that name is Jesus, who is the Lord and who is our what Savior and Redeemer. So in verse 8, the word said, Peter filled, I'm in Acts 4 and 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of the people. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a crippled and or uh, as how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So when Peter is asked, he puts his weight on it. He does not back down. He does not back off. He lets them know that the reason why they were doing what they were doing is because of Jesus. I'll leave you with this thought. And many of us are in churches and many of us are part of ministry. And this is what I challenge our congregation and leaders to think about as we do the work. Whatever ministry that you're responsible for, belong to, or a part of, that ministry is not about us. We don't get glory for what we do in the name of the Lord. Everything we do is because of Christ. So if and when people are being touched, uh, being healed, being ministered to, wh whatever it may be, we're instruments of the movement of Jesus Christ. In other words, we're nothing without him. Can't do nothing without him. Can't say nothing without him. Cannot minister without him. So we dare not take credit we dare not take credit for what is not ours to take credit. That's our lives, the gifts God has blessed us, and the list goes on and on and on. So we don't take credit, amen, for what Jesus is doing with us, in us, and through us. We must be bold and firm, just like Peter and John, speaking to the elders and the priests, that it's because of Jesus. Our ministries are because of Jesus. Being able to preach, teach, serve is because of Jesus. The lives that are being changed is because of Jesus. People being saved is because of Jesus. Lives are being turned around is because of Jesus. Well, we'll stop here. And we're grateful that you took time for this study. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. May we pray. Eternal Father, we want to thank you for how you have touched each of our lives. It really is all because of you. Without you, Lord, we would be completely lost. In fact, many of us would already be dead somewhere sleeping in a grave. But by your grace, by your love and your mercy, by your resurrection and your ascension, by the Holy Spirit that you sent to be in us and with us, 
we have the sense to know that we are saved by you. Lord God, we love you. We thank and give you praise and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Give God praise. Look, join us Sunday. Uh, Carter Metro, FTW.com. In fact, this week we'll be celebrating 112 years as a congregation serving the Lord in this community. And those who are able, you can join us. We'll be in parking lot worship. Hopefully the weather hold up. It's been real awkward the last couple of days and cold, but it's our intentions to be outside at 1045 Central Time in person in the parking lot. So, hey, come join us. And for those that cannot, we will be online at cardamentalftw.com. Have a great day and take care.